wonderful. Okay, hey, well, welcome everyone. Um, so thanks again for joining the Chase webinar series. We love doing this. Um, my name is Jules Tashiro. Um, I'm the director of A&D Business Development um, for Chase Office Interiors. If I haven't met you already, um, I would love to meet you. Uh, today's topic is something very close to my heart. I'm a, I'm a designer too, and I love Scandinavian design. I love mid-century modern, it is my thing. So our topic today is why Scandinavian design is taking the US by storm. It is CEU accredited. Um, this will be a 45 minute presentation. Um, we've got a 10 minute question time at the end. So please send your questions via chat. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take those questions and we'll, we'll chat at the end. And, and please do, because that would be fantastic if we can continue it. So we're very um, uh, rigid. We understand you have some time you know, capacity and whatnot. So we make sure we do that. Um, anybody that's um, IDCC, um, you've given, if you've given us your registration um, number or that your number at registration, then we process your credit within about five business days. You'll see that in your inbox. Um, as you may have seen on your screen, this, this uh, presentation is recorded, so it will be available on our website within 72 hours. So you can find that at chaseoffice.ca slash events and uh, you, can, you can play that back. So our next CEU webinar is on Thursday, the 19th of January. Um, it's aptly called uh, 2023, what is new in workplace design. So we're pretty excited about that one as well. Um, so please register for that on our website. Uh, we're getting lots of registration, so this is fantastic. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, Bethany Parks. Uh, Bethany's from upstate New York, where she received her psychology degree. She eventually stumbled into the contract furniture industry, don't we all, supplying solutions for major commercial buildings where she learned the art of managing relationships. She now holds the position of director of sales at Source International uh, and continues to be, uh, build strong relationships and solve client problems by sharing her knowledge and experience. So over to you, Bethany. I'm looking forward to this. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm uh, really grateful for the opportunity to present to you guys. So let's see what I can get here started with. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about Scandinavian design. This is IDCEC approved, and I'll go ahead and get that registered, as Jewel said. Um, my goal is to really... Um, educate you, entertain you, share information, and um, cause some visual stimulation, right? We're designers and um, idea people. So hopefully I can keep your attention for 45 minutes. Um, so the description of this CEU is really, you can see the visual here, the first um, slide that we're looking in. This is just kind of whets our appetite about what Scandinavian design looks like. It is has been a movement, you know, in most recent years, it started, we're going to look back in the history of it. That's going to be our first learning objective. We're going to talk about the history and the heritage and the influencers that got us to where we are today. And then we're going to talk about the design philosophy, and we're going to, going to talk about trends, and then we're going to talk about future trends that we can anticipate seeing in Scandinavian design. So, um, usually this CEU, this is so interesting. It's very fascinating. This CEU was created prior to COVID where I would stand in a room and I would ask a question and I would ask people to respond to me and it no longer happens, right? So I will put this question out there for you. And if anybody wants to answer it in the chat, that's wonderful. Um, I've learned to not stay quiet and wait for you. <laughs> So anyway, when you think of Scandinavian design, what principles come to mind? Are there certain, this, oops, I pushed the wrong button. Are there certain aesthetics or characteristics of Scandinavian design that you typically think of? There, thank you, Mark. Somebody's talking to me. Clean lines with curves, natural materials. Um, right on. Oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Okay, so here, simple. Thank you. So the learning objective, the first learning objective that we're going to talk about is the um, heritage and the history. I've got more chats. Simple but elegant. 
love this. Um, when we think about the term Scandinavian design, this is exactly what you guys are talking about. Clean, white walls, rustic, elegant, functional. There is a website called Cloudberry Living that is dedicated towards Scandinavian design. So if you haven't stumbled on them before, it's interesting to go, go down that rabbit hole if you've got time. But it has really, for designers, the mid-century modern and the Scandinavian design, typically you see people with their Pinterest boards or it's as Jules said, some people's favorites quite a bit of the time. But the history about it, the, you know, the geography is definitely an interesting piece of it. You know, it's its own specific area of the world. And this Scandinavian design phrase, the phrase started in the 50s after World War II. And it was, it's interesting to, to know their industrial revolution in that part of the world happens later than ours in the in North America. So they made things by hand a lot longer and a number of years longer than we did. So their industrial revolution, when that actually happened and it put it into mass production, it was in the 50, it was later in life. And so this mass production put these pieces, you can see up here in the top left-hand corner, those were chairs that were put into a um, furniture fair that was held by a company called Heels in London. And that was in the 20s. And so what Heels was doing was their version of a neocon and they were promoting Scandinavian design. And this this poster here is the first piece where it actually said design in Scandinavia. And so that was the phrase that started to come out of it. And it was a sales gig. It was a marketing. It was London marketing Scandinavian design. And that was the first entry into that phrase. Um, in the 20s, though, the people and the schools that were involved in laying the groundwork, Carr Clint was... Um, a huge player. He was involved with the furniture and spatial design department at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. And he was teaching there in, uh, in um, Denmark. So he, his philosophy was radically different than what had happened in the past. He was really concerned about students constructing furniture from the inside out, the form, the function of it, right? Using the right materials and would it work around a person's body? What was the functionality of it? And were the proportions going to be right? And that was not what had happened in the past. It was more about the aesthetics and the look of it rather than the function. It was more of a four leg chair, right? Like it's used to get sit on, to sat on, to sit in it and not necessarily worry about the comfort or the use for the person. So interestingly enough, you know, Walter Gropius in the twenties at Bauhaus, that functionalism piece was also happening there, but it was more about the raw and industrial piece in Germany. Um, Scandinavian design was going on, you know, a few years later, but it had a more humanistic piece to it. It definitely was concerned with wood and using different materials. So, but the idea of functionalism was happening between two different countries and kind of like it was spurring all of those discussions around design. So Fred Lunning, interestingly enough, the Lunning, the heels show in London had happened where they'd kind of showcased those chairs, right? The little mini neocon with Danish designers, with Scandinavian designers. Fred Lunning was a man that came into New York um, in the 20s. And he said he was actually a chair salesperson as well. And what he did was he brought some of these Scandinavian design chairs and he put them in the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria. And he would be talking to people about the different design aesthetics in New York. And it started to gain interest. So he actually ended up opening a store on Fifth Avenue. And in order to get more designers or more products in there, they went ahead and created a, a competition where they sent out to Scandinavian designers, whoever, you know, bring us your products, show us what you have, and whoever would win that prize would get their products showcased 
in the store in New York on Fifth Avenue, and they would win $400 in cash. So it was a sales guy doing his thing. It was a marketing piece that was going on, and it took one person to kind of be creative to spur these ideas on and promote the the Scandinavian designers schlepping chairs around, right? So I'm sure you guys have seen enough salespeople in and out of your offices. It's not a new thing. It's been going on for a long time. <laughs> so as we talk about people that have been involved in the in this movement, there are definitely icons to the industry. So Finn Jewel is definitely a name. And what we'll do is we're going to, it's kind of a game. And when you do it in person, it's a little easier. So I'm going to just rattle around here. But Finn Jewel was one of the first people from the Lunning Prize, from Fred Lunning, who brought product in. And he had a show at MoMA. And, um, and they got to showcase Scandinavian design. And it was printed in the New York Times and it kind of started to take off. So he was instrumental. His pieces were instrumental. However, this piece up here in the right-hand side was one of the products that was shown at MoMA. And it's called this Baker Sofa and the Pelican Chair. So while it gained attention and it gained some notoriety in the publicity piece, it's not always a great thing. They... <laughs> Part of the review for this Pelican chair said that look, it looked like a sad walrus. You can kind of see the looks here of those arms. <laughs> so he gained his notoriety, but it wasn't 100% positive. Um, this other piece here is the chieftain's chair. And this is still relevant today. It's still, you can still purchase this from some of the um, iconic stores. It's still available. You can see the beautiful shapes and the mixed materials. Here is his um, home in Denmark and it's now a museum. So you, if you actually go there, you can kind of tour his space and see his ideas and kind of live in there for a bit if you're walking through. Another man, the name, of course, Hans Wagner is iconic and matches up with Scandinavian design. And it's interesting to start to learn about this man. He actually designed 500 chairs and he would just sketch and sketch. His brain must have been just this amazing piece of machinery that just had all these different ideas. And when we look at the different, just four of his chairs, they're so distinctly different, right? So we know that, so he studied under Carr Clint. It was important to note that. So back in the twenties, Carr Clint was doing his school and Hans Wagner had studied with him. And out of this comes these interesting ideas. The wishbone chair is his, if you're not familiar, here's this flag halyard chair. It's not one of his most well-known pieces, but he also has this shell chair, again, relevant, timeless, still used in today's world, as well as the peacock chair, which kind of looks a little bit like the um, my grandmother's kitchen table chair, <laughs> a precursor. So Borg Morgensen, um, was a cabinet maker. And he, if you don't know his name, one of the things that he did, he was responsible for was he actually set in place standards for kitchen cabinet sizes. So if you can imagine that cabinets were all different shapes and sizes at one point, this man actually put the math to it and became, um, he put a standards program in place for cabinets, which is lovely. Um, he was also very concerned with functionality and he used wood mostly. He wasn't always so interested in the aesthetics and he just wanted it to be a comfortable, usable and inexpensive piece of furniture. He was always very concerned about the price points that he wanted the design to be achievable and affordable for all to access. So his this chair up here is called the Spanish chair. And this was one of his most well-known chairs. You can see it has this um, leather seat, the, the sling seat that he did. 
Um, down here, it looks a little less like an electric chair. It has more of the patina to it. And he really wanted people, the chair to fit the person and to have the person, you know, you kind of move into that chair and it forms around your body. So also, you know, really relevant and, and a name that we can't miss is Arnie Jacobson. And so... <sighs> He had to, during his tenure while he was designing in Denmark during World War II, he had to, he had to leave World War I. He had to leave, he fled to Sweden and he came back. So after the war, and he was just extremely prolific with his designs. Here we have his ant chair. And one of the things that's interesting to point out about this is that it's a three-legged chair. And he designed this to go around a table with the three legs. So I'm not so sure it would pass today's safety standards, but definitely an interesting aesthetic with a, a functional use is what he was after. Um, the seven chair is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. It's been knocked off by so many people. And then we have the swan and the egg chair. So he was, he was, well known, he had been, um, he received the commission for the SAS Royal Hotel at one point, and they hired him to do the interior design, the furniture, he was hired to do the cutlery, he was hired to do the uniforms. Someone said that he was even asked to kind of design the, the logos on the employee buses. He was in every piece of this project from nuts to bolts. So some people might call him a control freak, but he had a design aesthetic that he had to stick to in his own mind. One of his colleagues that originally worked for him was Werner Panton, and they did not necessarily agree on design aesthetics. So Panton left and started his own studio. You can see there's some distinct differences here between the designs that we saw earlier and Panton's designs. He was, he loved color. He loved playing with different shapes. He actually pushed the envelope when he started working on molded polypropylene chairs. That was a big deal in Scandinavia where everything was wood and natural materials. He started playing with plastic. And so you can see here his Panton chair was named after him, as well as his peacock chair. Um, he was dedicated to his interior design played on all of the different layers of a room. He worked on the walls, the ceilings. These are some of his installations. And considering this is Scandinavian design, and we always think of whites and naturals, this is totally against the grain, right? So this man had his own ideas as far as he was pushing things forward in the design world. You can see up here, this, these pink flower pot light fixtures, they're still available today and still relevant. So they're timeless design, but just different than what we expect from Scandinavian designers. This Alvar Alto seems to be what the normal design aesthetic would be. And he is credited with using, creating the first cantilever wood frame chair. And he and his wife designed um, textiles and window treatments, and they did all sorts of different wood pieces and definitely elevated and created a name for themselves. They actually started a company called Artec which sold their products and is still available today through certain retailers. But you can certainly see that this has been, this is a design aesthetic that, you know, he was born in the 1900s. And so he probably evolved into his being in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and it's carried through for sure. Um, he also, if you didn't know this, had done this Savoy vase. He worked in glass as well. So he has this unique vase that they created that each of them are hand blown still at a factory called Italia. So 
Maya Isla worked for Mary Mecco as a junior designer, and she really wanted to create this pattern called Unico. And it translates as poppy. And the, the owner at the time really did not want to launch this. It was definitely like a 60s, 70s flower power piece when she was creating it. And the, the owner thought, this is going to be such a phase that is never going to take off. We're not going to sell any of these. And yet here, this pattern is actually synonymous now with Mary Mecco. Oops, I have a chat here. I have to leave. Okay, bye, Kim. So um, also worth knowing is lighting, right? So Paul Henningsen, these pieces are iconic in the lighting industry. And interestingly enough, I believe this pH lamp was designed in the 20s, 1920s, and electricity had not been around for that long at that point in time. But his goal was to create lighting fixtures that hid that light bulb and played with refraction and lighting and you know bouncing the light off of all these different surfaces. So fabulous. Let's see, he says here, faith has never moved anything at all. It is doubt that moves. Hmm. So, and then we can't talk about Scandinavian design without at least acknowledging IKEA, right? So, is that what became Polson Lighting? Yes, Deborah. Yes, Louis Polson. Um, so, IKEA, this man, his, if you don't know this, IKEA, oops, IKEA stands for. Igvar Comprod Elmtard Agonard. That's real. And I got it right. So that is this man's first and last name and the county and city and county that he was born in. That's what IKEA stands for. And he died in, nine, in 2018. So he recently passed away. But when he was young and he was in school, he was dyslexic and he had a learning problem. Like he could, he'd had a hard, tough time learning in school. And when he graduated, his parents said to him, you're not going to do so well working in corporate America, corporate anything, not America, in the corporate world. You should probably go start your own company. And he, they gave him some money and he went and he started a furniture dealership. And his goal was to scale the company and spread the idea of Scandinavian design. And so in order for him to do that, he was lowering his prices and he was cutting margins and his competitors were not happy about it. So they went ahead and complained to the manufacturers and the manufacturers shut him down. And in order for him to follow through on his passion, he basically had to start his own company. So he came up with the idea of flat pack, the big blue building, scaled it that way and put the pricing at a point that people could afford. So interestingly enough. Okay, so those are some players that have been in the Scandinavian design world. We're going to talk about design philosophies. And some of this, this is exactly what we questioned about earlier in this, in this meeting. Right? What are the things that people think about? And it's about simple, it's clean, it's not ornate, it's timeless and functional. It's the form following the function. So the function first, right? Does the chair sit well? Are you comfortable in it? And then what does it look like? So again, when we talked about the industrial revolution happened later here in this part of the world, this meant that they were making things by hand for a lot longer. And they were definitely dedicated to a 360 degree aesthetic of a piece of furniture. They wanted it to look beautiful from all three sides. And they were doing well, all three sides, all sides. Um, and they wanted it to be something that people could enjoy, appreciate, be comfortable in. And that was um, almost like a, a piece that you would carry on for generations. It would be a heritage piece that you would share with your family. They were dedicated to this craftsmanship. They also had some climate issues, right? Because they're so far north. Now, I don't know what latitude they are compared to you guys, but they're definitely further 
north than than we are here in New York. Um, and so they had different resources, different woods were available to them. And so they had to limit what they, you know, they had limits on that. And they took the wood and they molded it and shaped it and did what they could with it to the best of their ability. They had a they have a saying about there's no such thing as bad weather, just poor clothing. So they're dedicated to a lifestyle that is about different weathers and different lights. They have less light sometimes of the year and more light in other times. Um, but their lifestyles are concerned mostly about family and friends and creating these home environments that are welcoming and warm, even though the climate might not be. And so Finn Jewell had a statement that said, one cannot create happiness with beautiful objects, but you can spoil a lot of happiness with bad ones. It's a commentary on practicality, right? Do we, we don't need it to be um, ornate. It can be simple. Less is more that whole philosophy that comes out of, you know, the Bauhaus as well. It's shared with this, with the Scandinavian design. And here's the understated aesthetic of Arnie Jacobson's seventh chair. It just is simple, it's clean, it's stackable, it's durable, it can get used in kitchens or cafes or dining rooms or bedrooms or offices. That's amazing, right? That a chair can be that timeless and so useful and so productive this little chair. So the other the other issue that was always concerned about Scandinavian design is about using low cost materials and having democratic design that is accessible to people and by using materials that fit into different people's budgets was important that it's available to the masses and that the wood the wood all of us kind of relate to the idea of wood. And so they, of course, are dedicated to sustainability. And these images, this image of their geography is just breathtaking, right? So we can't talk about this part of the world without talking about clean air, um, their dedication to um, social issues, organic foods. They've been involved with the UN had sustainable development goals for their, they were measuring different goals as far as clean air, clean water, social programs available, equitable programs. And so you can see here that the countries in Scandinavia were ranking right at the top, right? This was eco-friendly and that's their lifestyle. I can't help but appreciate that image. <laughs> So because of their dedication to sustainability, we've seen some interesting products come out of their geography. This particular chair is called the nobody chair and there's no additives or glue or screws. It's just a mold. And so you can kind of see that it was a piece of 100% recyclable plastic bottles that were a sheet and then there was a mold created and that chair was pressed in that mold. Um, you can find these online, you can buy them. It's an interesting look. The other piece is the Odger chair from Ikea and this is just made from renewable wood and recycled materials. Um, and we know that they lead the, the world actually in sustainability and that the rest of us are kind of following along as far as the awarenesses and evolution of clean environments and sustainability for the good of the next generations. The other interesting piece to talk about is anti Bifma versus EN. So in the States, we have the anti Bifma guidelines that have these test ratings. In Europe, they have EN, which is a different set of ratings. They do not, they don't match. So manufacturers in Europe will manufacture to their EN standards, and then it needs to kind of translate to get into the 
US standards of anti-BIFMA, the quality testing that happens here. So what we've seen happen with the advent of the resumercial world that's happened in the last couple years, five years, it's kind of an old word, word right now, but the quality standards, warranty discussions, what's the impact and need of residential versus corporate furniture? And when designers are specifying product, are all those things important? And so there is a goal to unify ANSI and EN standards for furniture. It's gonna take a while. It's an ISO goal that's on the charts, on the radar for some people. But for the time being, we put this slide in here because of this global market that we all exist in, Scandinavian, European, anywhere, like what though are the standards and what's necessary for designers when they're creating commercial and or residential spaces. So the next learning objective is to just talk about some of the key trends in materials. And what we wanted to talk about was color. And there's, it's interesting here to even hit this slide. This is kind of a lack of color. There's not a ton of color. It's all the neutrals. And what you can see is when they do engage some colors in these spaces, they're going to be in the more pastel-y neutral. It's not going to be bright or sharp reds. This is not from the Scandinavian heritage. They're like a soft-spoken people and their surroundings and their spaces and their products kind of reflect that. They're not loud. Um, what they also, of course, because of the sustainability discussion, the materials that they use, right? They'll use natural organic materials, woods, leathers, um, wools, cottons, and when they're doing spaces, they try to bring nature in as much as possible. Um, and they'll keep the woods and they'll keep the finishes and the stains to be as simple as possible and clean and airy and bright. And Alvar Alto had said this form must have a content and that content must be linked with nature. You can feel the natural pieces in this space. And again, part of this has to do with their geography and where they are in the world, that sometimes they only have three hours of light a day. So when they do have that light, the big windows, and there's not a lot of window treatments, and there's going to be um, mirrors and candles and creating that warm glow as much as they can inside when it's dark a lot of the day. You can also see that they're dead. This actual image kind of shows that they're dedicated to not having big, huge light fixtures that are taking up the space. They're simple lighting pieces that kind of meld into the design. And just because that's not colorful, it doesn't mean it's not interesting. There is a lot here in this image that shows the layering and the woods and the different woods with this little pop of color here of this yellow, but not a lot of it. Oops, oh my gosh, so sensitive. Um, so the layers of the light fixtures, the layer of the flooring, the tables, the textiles, and then, of course, dedication to shape. We saw these designs from some of the product designers, and they're unique and they're statements, and they don't need anything loud for textiles. They have their own statement because of the dedication to shape. And so, one thing to also just point out is that the Scandinavian design in the mid century modern was kind of going through this evolution at the same time. And there was a dedication to simple and not so ornamented. It's just clean lines, simple, but the mid-century modern, we can see the hues, we can see the color, it's deeper, it's richer. And it's, we can see on the second image, just the bright white light. And it's because of the geography, totally a different, part of the world and how that came about and showed up in design. And it took off, right? The Scandinavian design took off and Hollywood actually engaged it. And before you knew it, it was on Architectural Digest and there was no Pinterest and there was no HGTV. It just started to show up in magazines and 
And then it went on from there, right? So then it kind of infiltrated our our society and then the knockoffs and everything started taking off. And it's it has been a timeless design and it's still with us. We still see this, it has, it's still relevant in our world. And it's interesting to think about, you know, for just to shift gears a little bit, could all of the philosophies translate into this discussion about tiny homes? It's simple, it's clean, it's minimalistic, um, and people don't need as much stuff maybe. And do these trends have anything to do with each other? Maybe not. I'm not that interested in sleeping in that loft, but that trend has happened, these tiny homes for sure. Another thing to think about is the this dedication. Here's a product that came out of, out of Scandinavia and it's called the Trip Trap Chair. And you can see it was designed for longevity. It's a baby chair, but it lasts the life of the person by being adjustable and functional and useful. And it works. <laughs> Minimal, beautiful design aesthetic. So the last learning objective, because I know we're going to roll this down, is that we're going to talk about future trends in Scandinavian design. And this is actually a chair by Mudo. It's called the cover chair. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's been an interesting development in um, technology and how chairs are made. There are no screws in this. It's taking arm caps and bending wood and putting all the pieces together almost in a puritanic way, right? It's old school type of chair. Um, the words that we think of with Scandinavian design, one of them is huga, and it translates as the word hug. And it's a concept of that, right? The the fire and some cozy socks and a book and a cup of tea and maybe no phone, maybe no phone. And it's this commitment to being present and being doing your ordinary type of rituals. They have a thing there that if you go to the doctor with a cold, the doctor might say, go home and take some hygge, right? Just go rest and go settle in and take care of yourself. And it says here, you know, it's talking about a shared meal, um, sheltered from the rain at the bus stop or alone in bed with a hot water bottle and a good book. It's a lifestyle about slowing down and enjoying the things that are available to us. There's also a word that's called legome. This is a Swedish word. And it is this idea of not too little and not too much, right? Let's just like the Goldilocks thing, it's just right. And at one point, Ikea had a marketing campaign wrapped around the word legume about being just, just enough. I actually kind of think that's funny in that big, huge blue box full of a lot of things that they'd be marketing just right. So, and then a person to be on the lookout for, if you're not familiar with Bjark Ingels, rock star architect in the world right now. And he is definitely <laughs> reinvigorating Scandinavian design. And he has this phrase that he believes in, hedonistic sustainability. And he thinks it's not about what we give up. It's about what we get by living a clean and aware lifestyle. So his website is called is big B I G dot D K. I could go on and on about this particular person. He's fascinating to follow. You can look at all of his projects on his website and the thought processes he has moving forward. So he's one to watch. I mean, we looked at some of the the players in the past, and there are certainly people coming up and out of that area still that are contributing to design moving us future in the world. And that is a conclusion of our little CEU here. We touched on um, influencers and some history of the area, and we looked at philosophies and trends and just talked about some things moving forward. So the final thoughts are, you know, is Scandinavian design really a feeling or is it a philosophy or is it just about products? 
And so hopefully this CEU has given you a little bit of insight into that and maybe gives you something to ponder. And that would be the whole CEU. Fantastic. Thank you, Bethany. Wow. Couldn't be, it couldn't be a better CEU for me to host for my first Chase CEU. I absolutely love, <laughs> I love this design, Scandinavian design. I've got a few private uh, messages come through here um, that I wanted to share with you here as well. Um, oh. Yeah, so we've got uh, great information. As a designer, I had no uh, idea about um, how the early days informed today, which is great. Somebody else says, I love the pelican chair. <laughs> so <laughs> stop hating the pelican chair, Bethany. <laughs> I actually quite like the pinning and chair too. Um, yeah, so the somebody else wants to know how, tell us more about Ingalls. So, what, oh. yeah, what you said you could talk for hours on that. Let's hear. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I've, and any of you can leave whenever you want because I'm just going to go now, right? <laughs> no, don't leave yet. We've got some other oh. questions, but yeah, no, I'm interested about Ingalls too. So his website, you really have to go to big.dk or follow him um, on social media. And it's called Big Builds. They're, they have a studio in New York and also in Copenhagen. And I mean, he's been hired to do, he is brainstorming housing on Mars, right? So the United Arab Emirates has hired him to do that. He's done, he's changed the landscape of the Manhattan skyline. Um, it's fascinating. And he originally had wanted to be a um, cartoon artist. His parents sent him to school in Barcelona and out he comes dreaming about urban planning and buildings and structures. He's got shows on Netflix. You can find them on YouTube. It's just, he's fascinating to follow fascinating. fascinating i'm definitely here it is abstract on netflix has an episode about bjork ingles right and uh talking about netflix we've got michelle boya i hope i pronounced that right michelle sorry um she said if you're interested in sustainability and furniture she recommends that we watch the show broken on netflix i've watched that show one of the episodes um, highlights furniture manufacturing over the century and includes ikea it is really oh. fascinating fascinating because um, Ikea really gets a bad press, but essentially I think, um, my personal opinion, that they've, they've carried that philosophy through for sure. So um, somebody else said, here, here on poor clothing, which was pretty funny. Um, I personally, the Odja chair I've had, I own that chair. So lots of stuff going on there and really, really fascinated by the Ansi Biffenma and the... Um, the Europe, obviously, the European piece for me as well, because we bring a lot of European furniture over as well. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, we've got, there you go, yeah. Abstract on Netflix has the episode on Ingalls there. And um, also impressive Swedish accent, Bethany. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's good too. And legume, legume, um, there's an Italian one as well, QB, Quanto. Quanto besto, I probably got that horribly wrong. As much as you like, as much as you need. So it's the same sort of philosophy around that too. So any other questions from anyone? I think you answered a few on the way through. So yeah, Coulson lighting for sure. I don't think we have. Yeah, we've got awesome presentation going on here. So yeah, anything else that we want to touch on before we before we finish up? This is just, can I just say, Jules, this is lovely that Chase Office does this for your industry in that area. I've been presenting around the country and this is fabulous. You do a really great job and I just want to um, applaud you and your team for putting this together and your community that it shows up like this. This is wonderful. Maze is mazes me and as well and thank you for that feedback um we have a lot of people following us and this is incredible we love we love doing this obviously it was born out of covid um and everybody doing zoom and uh, you know everything else but uh, but the feedback has been phenomenal so yeah it's great uh, it's great feedback so we do have 
a news, uh, sorry, the next one, the next CEU uh, webinar is, as like I said at the beginning, was uh, was is on the 19th. Um, so if you haven't, uh, 19th of January, so if you haven't uh, put yourself down for that one, please do. Um, most people are renewing every single time. Um, and it's 2023, what's new in workplace design? So we're fascinated by that, very aptly named. So um, so if we don't have, oh, we've got, actually, sorry, we've got a couple more comments here. This is great. I love this. So much feedback. Just give me a second here. So we've got Abstract on Netflix. We just did that one. There's some great stories on women architects from Sweden, Google design stories. So that's a good one. Um, we've got some thanks here. And then uh, Mark says he has a bunch of Scandinavian, Danish and Swedish furniture from the 60s at home. My grandparents lived in Sweden. I do too. I freaking love Scandinavian <laughs> furniture. I absolutely love it. And it's the stuff looks still looks amazing and lasts forever. Thank goodness. And it does. I mean, it's expensive now. I mean, we've done a few of that. Actually, I got a few more comments here that, you know, it's functional, functional furniture and and the form follows function, et cetera. So those things are huge around um, around Scandinavian design. So yeah, I absolutely loved this, this CEU. So thank you, Bethany, appreciate that. Anybody who's come through, please fill out our survey. You'll, um, you'll receive it later on today and then we can understand a little bit more. We're just setting up our uh, webinar series for the next uh, 12 months through Chase. And we're gonna continue this because it's been so fabulous. And um, we'll let, make sure that we improve them, the events, just to, to make sure we're doing what we want you to do. So reminder to register for that CEU, um, chaseoffice.ca slash events. Um, and there you go. So Bethany, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tad, for the background stuff that's going on here. And thank you everybody for taking the time today. It's been, uh, it's been a fabulous CEU.